Welcome to Eastlake. We are an inclusive faith community dedicated to the free search for truth and meaning, seeking to live out a more just and life-giving spirituality in the modern world. We see faith as less about doctrines and dogmas demanding total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is a gift and love is the point. We welcome the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are journeying and have come to grow, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to shine, welcome home. Today, we hear from Jason Lewis as he wraps up our series, The Art of Losing. Please check the description for links to our quarterly Spotify playlist and guided meditation. Well, hey, everyone, and welcome to the final week in our series, The Art of Losing. When I started this series, I really just wanted to create a space and a conversation around failure. I think we all know that there's a million things in our lives that we're deeply passionate about, things that we want to succeed at, things that we want to grow at, things that we want to pursue with all of our ourselves involved in them. And we're aware that along that road that there's lots of failure. And that's very, very challenging. It's very heartbreaking sometimes to realize that the thing we love, the thing we care about the most is kind of fraught with lots of moments of absolutely blowing it. And I know this series started with Nate, and I hope you guys watched it, this this message about why the world needs more failures, why so many of the things that we benefit in the modern era come from people who had the courage to fail publicly and repetitively, our benefits in medicine, in science, in technology, and in culture often flow out of a group of people willing to fail and willing to continue to fail in pursuit of an end goal. And that we, we need to remember to be courageous as we walk into the things that matter to us. Because as Nate put it, if you care about it, you're likely to fail at it quite a bit, at least for a while. And then the second week I talked to my sister Callie, um, mostly because I wanted to have a conversation around the reality that sometimes failure occurs not because a lack of talent exists or not because you didn't work hard and not because you don't have the ability, but sometimes because there are trends and forces and larger things abroad that seek your failure. And that, that's a tremendously hard thing to swallow. It's a hard thing to face down and to continue to walk forward with that courage. And that that may require a shift in perspective around our concept of value. That we don't so orient to success that we don't so orient to failure, that we, our personal value, which flows from the divine, which flows from a far greater concept of meaning than just if we win or if we lose, if we are in the crowd or if we are out, that we have an innate value that far surpasses that. And that to remember that oftentimes bolsters our resolve, that we should continue to head toward the path that gives us the most meaning and the greatest fulfillment even when there are things against us. And today, I wanted to talk about a part of failure that's always really fascinated me, that I think is sometimes so encouraging for me, especially in the moments when it is really hard. And that is, how much can we take? How much are we really equipped to handle in regards to failure? Am I someone who is able to hold failure and continue to move forward. And then secondarily, if I can, is it a muscle? Is it something that I can grow stronger? Is it something that I can make better? Could I become so good at coping with failure that it begins to have overall a significantly less impact on my ability to move forward? 
I think we could all recognize that if we could have that, then we would be infinitely more dangerous when pursuing the things we love. We'd be so much more capable of loving consistently, of showing up in the ways that we really want to, of building the lives that we dream of. And so this all started for me probably like a month or so back, uh, or a couple months ago actually, when I was first asked to do the series. And I had been reading like a lot of Viktor Frankl, which I don't know if you know him, but he's just a brilliant mind. And he has this very famous quote, and it says, that which would give light must endure burning. And I love that quote. I swear I'm going to get it tattooed at some point. But <laughs> the idea is that when we do something, when we pursue something, or when we make a choice, there is without question going to be a moment and going to be moments of burning. The idea that there is suffering, failure, embarrassment, the lack of the ability to produce the thing we'd like in pursuit of the larger goal. And I think if we look at any great success, we find that as true. But it's hard to remember that when we're in the middle of it. It's hard to see and to recognize that suffering and success are so intimately tied. Like right now, I've got two boys. My my partner has a son, Xander. He's four. And my son, Huck, is five, almost about to turn six. And he's at this place right now where I think he feels like everything dad does is the coolest thing. So, like, whatever I see dad do, I got to do. Riding a skateboard, dunking on a basketball hoop, lifting weights, whatever it is, he wants to be able to do it. But the problem is, is that he's five. (laughs) So, like most of us when we're five, we have a lot of things we'd like to do. But because we're not really our most coordinated self. We're not our most well-informed self, and we're not our wisest self. It's very hard to succeed with any sort of regularity. In fact, what's actually most regular is failure. And right now, when with my son, he'll go out and he will try forever to make a basket on like a 10-foot hoop, but he's five, and that's an incredibly high height for someone who's five. They don't even play on those, those rims like, you know, when they play in like a league. But he'll try and try and fail and fail and fail. And he'll get to the point where he's so emotionally distraught over the failing that he's crying. And he will say things like, I can't. And I don't just kind of slap on like, hey, we don't say you can't. Because I know the feeling. It's very real. When we fail consistently, we begin to make a belief about ourselves. We say something about who we are because we think the failure says something about who we are. And we say something like, I can't. And so what I want to do is help him remove, and I want to at least inform you all of what I've found very useful, which is to detach the failure from who and what you are. So for Huck, I say, it's not that you can't, buddy. It's just that it's hard. And he'll cry and he'll go, it is hard. It's so hard. And I'm like, it is hard, buddy. It's really hard here. It's hard to pursue anything you care about and to fail. There are days as a father where I am furious that I'm not able to show up consistently and be the best version of a father I can be. You know why? Because it's hard. It's not because I can't. It's because it's incredibly hard. Or wanting to show up as the most loving and supportive partner I can. It's super hard. It's not that I can't. It's that it's hard, that failing and succeeding are so intimately tied that it's incredibly challenging to pursue one without the other. But learning how to see failure as that which is hard and not that which communicates a message about ourself is very vital to equipping us with the durability to continue onward, to enable my son to continue to shoot. Because one day, he will make it. And then one day, it will be easy to make it. And if he gives up now, if he writes a story about who he is now, boy, his odds of succeeding are so much slimmer. Fortunately for him and for us, we are made of something rather unique. Science says that our brains and our physiology, like the way our our chemistry works and our body and everything, is actually designed in some way to absolutely face failure over and over again and to not lose capacity. So we're already aided by nature. How do we know this? Because if you've ever read anything about science or evolutionary theory, you've heard this phrase maybe, the survival of the fittest, right? Which dictates that that which survives, that which gets to survive, is that which is most fit for the environment. 
and who is fit for the environment, those most capable of adapting to a never-ending, ever-changing reality. It sounds strange, but right, we did, we are the remnant of beings who were able to survive ice ages and saber-toothed tigers <laughs> and all manner of disease and natural disasters and all these things. And I know that oftentimes in our life, we may not feel that we are those people, but we are deeply and intimately connected to that and their capacity to fail and to continue onward, to suffer and to continue walking is what's led us to this point. And I think sometimes it's helpful to recognize that you're a tougher thing. You're made out of real tough stuff. I used to get like injuries all the time when I played sports when I was younger and I'd call my uncle who was a trauma surgeon. And he was an ex-Marine and a really tough guy and played Division I football, just a really gnarly guy. And he would always say, whenever I get super down, whenever I get super discouraged, because like, I can't do it, I can't do it. He'd just go, you're a caveman, buddy. You're a caveman. You were built. You are built to overcome this. You just are. That's how you got here. And you need to hold that as true when things are really hard. Otherwise, you're going to forget who you are. And then your ability to walk toward the things you know that are the most important Oh, you're going to lose the gas. You're going to lose your will to continue onward. I did a thing with 23andMe a while back, which basically like analyzes your DNA. And in it, I found out like what I was kind of composed of. And I have a very unique makeup. My mom, I'm basically 50% Norwegian from my mom. <laughs> and I'm like 50% Nigerian from my dad. It was like 49, 49. And then I had like a couple percents of some other random things. But the thing was, I just kept thinking about those two groups and that genetically I'm bonded in some weird way tied to these groups of people who have these very dynamic origin stories, very arduous and brutal roads to survival, especially my African side. To think about that if I'm here now and I possess a Nigerian genes, then that means I am tied to the ancestors that survived the Middle Passage, that were picked up on boats. Slapped and changed, stuck in the bottom, surrounded by death, refuse, made to row endless distances only to arrive on a shore and be subjected to hundreds of years of slavery, abuse, and punishment to survive to the point, to adapt and endure and face all manner of hardship, failure, and woe to bring me here breathing far freer and far more healthfully and alive than they could have ever possibly imagined. And I know that we all have different stories, but how do we not see ourselves as tied to those things, as these amazing dreams made real through people who didn't quit, who didn't give up, who saw failure and made their peace with it as a component of the journey to success? I know that I've, uh, I've followed this guy for a long time. His name is uh, David Goggins. And I don't know if you know him. He's a very intense guy. Forewarn you. He's probably like the most intense guy you ever meet. He's just a light-skinned black dude who was a Navy SEAL. And um, he's a guy that's kind of lived on both sides of the coin. He's lived as a moment where he didn't believe in himself. He didn't pursue his passions. He didn't live a full life and ended up being overweight, depressed, all sorts of things. And then deciding at some point that I'm just going to do the hardest things that I know are true, that I know I care about, that I know I want, and I'm going to face down the fact that I'm probably going to fail a lot on the way there. But in so doing, I got a shot. I get a shot at living a life I really want and being who I really am. And he has this quote, which I've always loved, and he says, everybody comes to the point where they want to quit. I, always, I just want to repeat that. Everybody comes to the point where they want to quit. And I know it's easy when we look out in the world, we, we follow, obviously, in this culture, there's famous people, there's celebrities, there's elite athletes, there's, you know, amazing minds and scientists and all these creators and artists. And we go, look at them, they're just winning and winning and winning and winning. And I'm trying to draw a frog and I can't do it. I tried to, you know, hit a golf ball and I, I never will be able to do that well, right? How are they able to? Clearly, it's because they're so gifted. But truly what it is, is, is if David's right, which I think he is, is that everybody comes to the point where they want to quit. In pursuit of where you see them now, they've had that moment. But the differentiator, the diviner between what they become and what they, they don't become is, as he says, it's what you do in that moment when you want to quit that says everything about who you are. 
Hey everyone, it's Kristen. Just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for tuning in. I hope that you're finding these messages helpful for you in your everyday life. Um, that's what we're trying to do here is gather around the idea that life is a gift and love is the point and let's give ourselves ways to move forward in that in our own everyday world. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for being a part of this community. To those of you who have participated and given financially, we wanna say thank you to you. Everything that we do here happens because people make contributions. People say, I value this place. I want it to exist for me and for other people. And so I'm going to support it. And so we just want to say how grateful we are um, that you do that. And for those of you who maybe haven't had a chance to contribute yet, um, we would ask you to consider maybe doing so. If you find this place beneficial, if you find these messages helpful for you, then um, consider joining us in that way. You could go to eastlakecc.com to make a contribution. Um, and we just always are thankful for the people who want this place to exist. So thanks again for tuning in. Let's get back to the message. And so I think as we go through this, we have to realize that it's not the failing that matters. That's not what makes us so capable of taking and withstanding and strengthening our ability. It's our ability to manage what we do when we're in the moment of quit. When we're in the moment of I've failed, that's enough. What do we do there? And I and he, he goes on to write, as you, I told you, he's a SEAL, and he details some of the training regiments of like BUDS, which is like this hell week where you, you take all the, the Navy SEALs and they become SEALs. This process is nightmarishly rigorous. They basically don't sleep for a week. They're constantly wet. They're never warm. They're not fed. They're overtrained. They're made to swim huge distances and crawl through the mud. It's like a nightmare. And many, many, many people wash out of it. Very few people complete it. But what he says is that on the first day, when you show up to Bud's, you're obviously intimidated. Your adrenaline's high because you're like, this is it, man. This is the kind of highest tier. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, at least I'm having the fear that I'm going to fail, that I'm not going to be able to do this. But he said that what the instructors say your first day is this. People with less intelligence, less strength, less character, and less ability have completed this. So if you don't complete this, it'll be because you chose to. And there's nothing wrong with that. The world needs all kinds of people. But this here, you have to choose this. That's the only way through. I think when we look out at life, we have to ask ourselves what we're choosing. Because as the Navy SEAL commander put it, there really isn't a path without failure. But it's what you want to choose. It's what you want to see and what is worth undergoing, as Viktor Frankl puts it, the burning. So if we know that we are these people built to endure, if we can recognize that even historically we are these terribly tough beings, if we recognize that we're in the pursuit of giving off life and so burning is a part of the story and that we're actually equipped to do this, then how do we get better at it? How do we grow stronger? How do we make sure that the muscle gets more capable of coping with failure as it comes across our path? I think the first thing, the most important thing we have to do is do this. Recognize what you can control. I want to say that one more time because I think it's one of those things that we forget that failing isn't really something that we can control. We can only control what we do. And it is by that measure that we can then release failure as just a component, as a piece, as an actual step towards success. We see it as part of the equation and not some errant thing that happens to only the dumbest and the least talented people that in fact, everybody has to walk this path toward the thing that they hope to be. There's a scripture, if you've ever read the Bible, but, and it says, you know, you fall down seven times and you get up eight, right? Fall down seven times, but get up eight. And the concept there is this, is that you don't really control that you fall down seven times. It's not really in your purview, right? You're just going to fall. It's how it's going to go. What you're in control of is that you can get up, is that you can choose to get up an eighth time and go and see and continue on. And that 
our recognition of this, if we can silence our mind to all the other distractions, to all the other narratives that get built around failure, we become significantly more capable as people and as those who are trying to bring the world into a more loving and compassionate place. There's this guy that I follow, his name's Ryan Holiday, and he is kind of like the purveyor of Stoic thought in the modern era. And basically, Stoic thought is like based around Marcus Aurelius and some interesting named dudes like Epictetus and Seneca. And they're these very smart guys that were really concerned with how to be your best self, how to show up in the world as consistently as possible and be your very best self, your most courageous, your most loving self that you could be, your most just self. How do you do that? And Marcus Aurelius thought it kind of came down to one big thing. And he says, you possess control over your mind, not outside events. Observe this and you will find strength. And and Ryan, right, this Ryan Holiday guy, he goes to like talk to all these big corporate folks. And he, he, he like, he's a super sharp guy. And he talks like sports teams. But he has this thing where he's talking to these athletes. and And I always found it really compelling where he's like, you know, Guys, I I could come here and say, like, there's a lot I have to say about how you need to think and what you need to think and what, you know, and it can get really technical. He's like, but actually none of that's really true. Here's what I can tell you. You can't control what the weather's like. You can't control whether you win or lose. You can only control how you play. You can't control if they cheat or if the refs call the game fair. You can only control how you play. You can't control if you're your strongest self, if you're your fastest self, if you're the smartest person in the room, you only can control how you play. You can't control if you do everything perfectly or if balls bounce the wrong way or if you get unlucky, you can only control how you play. You control how you play. You control how you play. And that statement always sits in my mind when failure comes. It's something I've worked out and trained for a very long time, which is that when things go wrong, touching on that kind of adapt and overcome concept, right? That idea that we are these adaptable beings who have survived through time, that we are these individuals equipped to cope. It's really simple. We just control how we play. We can't really control much of anything else. I think oftentimes we are looking out at the world and we're thinking that things are happening to us. And there's an element of it that's true. Like if I were to say you wake up in the morning your tire's flat, your gas tank's empty, you spilled coffee on your new shirt, and you find out as you're heading into work that your boss is going to demote you to a lower position in salary. What's the first thing that's likely going to come out of your mind? Or it will pop into your mind, but then come out of your mouth. That you, that you failed. That today, you're going to write a story that says today is a bad day right? Your brain builds a story. It takes the data. It makes it mean something. And it's like, you are a failure. And this is what it looks like. But if I were to put a robot in that same shoe, in those same places, and I said, what happened? He'd go a random sequence of events that simply were not in my favor, most of which were outside of my control. Does it change what your job is today? He would go, no. All I can control is what I do. I can control those things. And do you see how the lightness, the awareness of how failure takes on a different meaning, a different energy inside us when we begin to see that failure is not only a part of the process, not only something we can cope with, but also a lot of it is outside of our control. And then in the end, win or fail, the only thing we really get to control is our mind, is how we play. And in so doing, we find strength and we are able to continue to move forward. And if that's the case, then it is a muscle. Then it's a a habit. It's something you can strengthen. A while back, I read this fascinating study, and then we'll get out of here because I know I'm rambling. But I read this fascinating study about pro athletes, in particular basketball players, and shooters, three-point shooters, who make their whole living and their employment based on how frequently they can make shots. And they ran these psychological profiles against regular folks just to see um, kind of the difference. And they took guys to the court and they said, hey, you know, shoot 100 threes, right? And every time that they made a three, they were supposed to say something about why they felt that happened, right? Yada, yada. And then what they, when they missed the three, why they felt that happened. And what was so interesting, not, not every time, I mean like at the end of the whole study. And what was fascinating was that for regular people, the most common expression was is, 
I'm not very good. I, I, uh, I, I don't know what's wrong with me today. Or um, I didn't try super hard. Or I got really tired, right? Or whatever. All of these reasons. When it came, when it came to the pros, they literally asked them, well, why'd you miss a shot? They would just say this. I mean, I don't know. That's not really important. I don't really, I don't really think about it. It's not something I can control. It's over. So like, I can only control what I do now. So I only really think about the shots I make. I just kind of, and they asked them like, what do you think after you miss? What's your level of confidence? And they found that in pro, in pro three point shooters, there's almost no change in their level of confidence. They could miss 15 in a row and still feel like, yeah, the next one's money. Versus a regular, more normative person kind of going like, I've missed three in a row. I'm not going to make any more. I can't do it. And the impact on their proficiency and ability and capacity to grow and evolve and change and all these things are hugely different. Because if you have a short memory about when you fail and how you fail, well, boy, you become infinitely more dangerous. Because a guy who can shoot, a guy who can play, a gal who can see, or anyone who shows up to something like, all I can do is what I can do. And that's what I can do today. And if I need to learn from it, I will. But ultimately, I can only control how I play. What a powerful tool to move through life and to face down failure as it comes. I'm going to leave you with one final thing and then we'll get out of here. Which is basically this. I want you to remember this. It's maybe the most useful thing I've worked on and come to in the last probably month working on this content. And that's this, that a well-observed failure has more in it to guide one toward lasting, consistent, and true success than any measure of good fortune, talent, or easy wins ever have. That if we become the people who observe our failure as that thing most capable of informing us on what we need to adapt to, we will also become the people most likely to succeed and continue to evolve. And then failure isn't an enemy. No, failure suddenly becomes our greatest teacher. Because if you're not careful, you can fall into the idea that the point of life is to win, is to succeed, but it's not really. The point of life is to do and to draw meaning and learning and wisdom from the doing. It's much like Viktor Frankl says, if you would seek to give light, if you're a member of this community where life is a gift and love is the point, you want to give it. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to burn a little. But if you figure out how to view the burning as the method by which you can give even more light, how much heat does a flame from a candle give off? Right? How much light does the flame from a candle give off? How much light comes from a bonfire? Significantly more. Right? But how much more burning is there? You see, as you grow in your capacity to give light, so too does the burning grow. But so too are you more equipped to handle it. When we see people that are successful, right, based upon whatever standard, or you see someone, here's what I'd like to argue, that they're actually the most equipped at failing. They're the most capable of observing a failure well. And so because they are, they don't attach it to their sense of self. That therefore makes them durable. They recognize that inside those failures lies all the ways they need to adapt, which means they grow stronger and they continue onward, which means that they control how they play and they play the game their way. Sometimes when I, I hold my, well, when I did when he was young, my son, my sister's babies, or even my close friends, I say something to them, and I don't really talk about it, probably because it might come across as creepy to them, but it's not really. It's much more of like, I always want, I just assume, I guess, maybe it's some weird superstitious part of me that thinks that like babies have like all the wisdom in in the world because they're the most recent from the ether. Maybe they've got something in there still. I don't know, but 
I do this thing where, especially I hold, held my niece in gym, and she's brand new. She's like a couple months old. And I held her. And I just looked at her face. And I just said, welcome to Earth, little Njeme. It's really hard here. But we try to look out for each other. We'll try to look out for you. I think the thing is, is that as we go through life, we fail, we get hurt, we go through pain. And we can get lost in the idea that failing is something unique unto us, that pain is something and suffering is unique unto us. But the truth is, is we're not alone. If you're watching this, then you're a member of this community. Everybody that you know in it is a failure, has failed profoundly and publicly, and or maybe not publicly, but certainly profoundly. <laughs> Let's say that for sure. Because if you're human, that's what, it, that's what it is. But what you're also seeing is that we've continued on. Man, I have watched this organization fail in such profound ways, and I've also watched it succeed in ways that I never thought it would because of the willingness to acknowledge its failures, to face them down, even when it's embarrassing and unpopular and almost kills you. That's why I revere this community. That's why I've continued to be a part of it for more than a decade of my life. Not because we have the best ideas and everything's perfect. It's because I think we do a half-decent job of copping to it when we don't get it right. And then learning from it and trying again. And that's all life ever is. And that's all we can do. But we can do that. And if you can do that, and if you can continue to recognize your value, you can recognize that you're built for this. This is how this game goes. This is what you have in you. And that you can do this. You can do You can do what you'd like to do, and you can play the game the way you'd like to play it. You just can't play it without failure. But you're built for that. And I think if we can do that as a community, if we can look out at the broader world and go, where is there no love? Where does love need to go? Right? We recognize this life's a gift. Everything's on loan. And we're here to be light to people. We're here to be that kind of warmth to people in the hardship of life. That may be, in fact, the most important thing about a spirituality is its capacity to help drive meaning into the parts and areas where we fail, where we're not our best self. I mean, if it's not that, I, I don't want to play the game of if it's right. I want to play the game of does this give light to someone? Is this going to help someone feel stronger, more capable, more lovely, more precious, more able? I think we're all a member of that club. So as you go from here this week, as you encounter failure in your relationships, in your career, in your pursuits and passions, or in the broader world, remember, I was made to deal with this. My job is to adapt and overcome. And I do so by accurately observing this failure and paying close attention, not because it has anything to do with me. We have a short memory about what that's about, but we have a long view of paying attention that my road to success, my road to following my passion toward being the best individual I can be, toward giving the most light, is going to come from me failing and being honest about how I need to adapt. If I do this, pretty much nothing can beat us. So, I love you. I thank you for your time. Thank you for journeying with us in this three-week series. I'm so excited for all the stuff that's coming next. I hope you're having a lovely summer. And just don't forget, you are someone who was imbued by the divine with all the pieces you need to navigate this reality. You are whole. And if things get hard, which they sometimes do, just ask for help. We'll try to look out for you. Thank you again. Have a great week. Take care. Peace. Thank you for joining us. To make a donation, head to eastlakecc.com slash donate.